At Maverick Public Relations, growing your influence is their specialty. NPR works with remarkable companies in the cannabis industry to deliver exceptional results. Experience big agency expertise and outstanding client service delivered by seasoned and knowledgeable experts. Connect with Maverick PR today and move your company to the next level. Visit them today at www.themaverickpr.com. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And welcome back to the Cannabis Podcast. If this is your first time, well, an especially warm welcome for you. I hope you have some interest in cannabis, because if you do, you've come to the right place. We're going to spend the next, oh, 30, 40 minutes or so talking about all kinds of things cannabis. In fact, today is a very special day. The day this episode is released is October 17, 2021. And that is exactly three years from the day the cannabis was legalized in Canada. So we're going to be talking a bunch of things about legalization here in Canada. We're also going to look at a call from cannabis retailers in B.C. for the resignation of B.C. Solicitor General over his handling of the cannabis portfolio. That's an interesting story. A weird campaign on the socials for the Ontario Cannabis Store. Just really weird is how I'm perceiving that. New Brunswick gives their illicit weed a big fat F on the quality scale. On Cultivar Corner, we have some more craft from BC. This is coming with a taste from Smoker Farms and their Master Kush Ultra. Plus, we're going to share some thoughts on how it used to be before legalization. All of that and more is coming up on episode 82 of the Cannabis Podcast. Happy Cannabis Day, Canada. We did it. Three years ago today, we started down this little ride. When cannabis was legalized in our country, in fact, I may even play a little segment from the very first episode of the Cannabis Podcast, where we talked with Ian Power. Ian Power from St. John's, Newfoundland, the very first person to buy cannabis legally in Canada at midnight on October 17th, 2018. We'll grab a snippet of that interview to kind of flash us back to that. There's a lot of things that have happened since then. I mean, it was shortly after legalization that the whole idea of this podcast originated. And in fact, I was just chatting about this the other day with my buddy David Wiley, who runs, of course, Okanagan Z, theounce.ca, doing a whole bunch in, in his marijuana media corporation. He started just after legalization. We realized that the two of us both liked cannabis at that same time. And it was, uh, we were both in Toastmasters at that time on October 17th. The day that legalization occurred on 2018, we actually had a Toastmasters meeting. I was the Toastmaster that day. And let me think, can you think what the theme might have been? <clears throat> the theme was cannabis legalization. <laughs> I spent the entire meeting talking about how how gleeful I was over the fact that I had been waiting 45 years since the Ladane Commission in 1972 for legalization to actually happen in Canada. It had happened. I was now in a group of people that I would not necessarily talk a lot about cannabis with, but I threw everything against the wall and said, that's what we're here to talk about today. That's when I learned that, as I say, David had uh, the same fascination and love of cannabis, and he's created a whole empire now with OkanaganZ.com and the ounce.ca and a number of other properties as he's develop, developing them. Good job, David. You're doing a fabulous job, and you're starting to make some noise, and people are noticing what you're doing. Another memory I have, going back to three years ago, was the very first interview for the very first episode of the Cannabis Podcast. I managed to track down and get a hold of Ian Power, who bought the very first legal cannabis in St. John's, Newfoundland, and we had an excellent conversation. Go back to episode one. You can hear the whole thing. But I'm pulling out a couple of snippets here, just because I think it's relevant to the fact that we are celebrating three years of legalized cannabis today. In that conversation with Ian three years ago, I asked him a question. We've been at this month now. How do you think we've done? We've been a little over a month now. How do you think it's gone? Uh, I think they underestimated the the demand. Yeah. Uh, Mostly what I'm seeing is uh, senior citizens in the tweed store downtown, uh, at Dominion, grocery store, Loblaws, right? You can buy yeah. cannabis at the grocery store, which is really? mind-blowing. 
Yes. You can go <laughs> wow. buy a grocery and you can go over to the liquor store and then you can go into the cannabis store. I'm definitely All in the wrong things. province. <laughs> All right. Newfoundland's very progressive. Like I said, we're very progressive. On a yeah, lot of I'll say. Well, that is cool. Yeah. I'd like to give a shout out to the only independent store here, Thomas Clark, THC Distributing. I'd like to say, you know, he's doing a great job and uh, as the absolutely. independent running company, right? Like, yeah, that's a, a dream of his for 25, 30 years. I'm glad to see that he's doing great and his business is going really well. And absolutely, you know, more power to him for being an independent and not being, you know, a big corporation. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And in fact, on that regard, I, I was aware of, of Thomas H. Clark. I love the fact that yeah. his name is not actually her, but because everybody recalls him that, he gets the THC in his name. Yes, That's pretty he gets cool. the THC. And the yeah. thing I liked about his story is that the first pot that he sold was to his dad, which I thought was pretty yeah. cool. So where do you see ultimately legalization going in, in Canada? Ian? I would hope to see that it would go for advertising and be allowed because there's a huge amount of careers that are waiting to start because of advertising. Uh, I would like to see the medical program, because we're talking about phasing it out, but to uh, become more robust and to be subsidized by the taxes from mm -hmm. recreational cannabis. The price for medicinal should be $2 a gram and no more, in my opinion. Boy, you wouldn't know, that people be are nice. sick. $2 yeah, exactly. gram would be nice, you know, mm -hmm. people are sick, shouldn't be profiteering off the sick, you know, How a true. lot of other aspects happen that's profiteering off the sick. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, independent growers should be included going forward. They should look at that because with the supply, with demand so high and the supply low, those people can pick up the slack, yeah. give the bigger producers a chance to grow more product. Uh, these people are uh, knowledgeable. They've been at it. Some of them are at it 50 years, 60 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, just like the regular, the big companies, they all be tested independently by an independent company. Uh, yeah. You know, oversight from the government, but not too much government control. Yeah, because that just gets in the way. That gets in the way a lot, yeah. And then later on in the conversation, we touched a little bit on cannabis and driving and how, of course, from an impaired perspective, it's completely different from alcohol. And then Ian had an idea as well about how he wanted to change the perception of time and cannabis. They won't bother pulling me over because I'll give them an hour lecture on cannabis. <laughs> 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 Again, like I, I don't smoke and I, and I write down the time when I do imbibe. So okay. So you have accurate like, information you can present to them. Well, ten seventeen in the morning, and then I wait three hours. Okay. Right. So okay. ten seventeen because that was the date that it was legal. Right. Ah, so, of course. Uh, of ten course. seventeen <laughs> is the new four twenty. So America has four twenty. We now have ten seventeen. Oh, right? I love that. I haven't heard that right? before, so but I like 10, that. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a T-shirt with that on it. Ten seventeen is the new four twenty. That means yeah. I have twenty minutes until ten seventeen yeah. my time. <laughs> See how perfect is that, right? You the podcast. And that will be perfect. Have your, have your morning pop, and then ten seventeen in the night time, right? So no, no more waiting up till four twenty. Oh, there you go. Oh, I like so that. In, right, gonna... so ten seventeen at night, you can sit back, relax. The kids have gone to bed. You know, it's you know, parent time or adult time. <laughs> Excellent. And to your point, it's ours. The the U.S. is say ours. Four twenties, ten seventeen is ours. I love that, Ian. That's 10, great. Seventeen is ours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that might not have taken off like Ian had hoped, but it was still a pretty cool idea. I had a great conversation with him, and that was a fabulous way for me to welcome legalization into our country. So, where were you three years ago today, October seventeenth, two thousand eighteen? What were you up to? Did you even notice that that day had passed, or was that just another day for you? Obviously, if you have listened to this podcast over the last three years, you realize it was a very important day for me, and it still continues to be. So, happy Cannabis Day! From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And I guess there can be some things that happen when you are stoned while producing the podcast that might have happened simply because you're stoned. This is the second time I've recorded this section. Actually, the first time that it's actually recorded. It's the second time I've done this section. But when I finished it, I realized that I had muted my microphone and it was all for naught. And it was probably some of the best pieces for this podcast I've ever done. But unfortunately, you won't hear it. I'll try to recreate it now. 
And since we've already talked about my friend David Wiley and OkanaganZ.com, that's going to be the source for our first couple of stories. And we're going to start off with the goofy one, the one from the Ontario Cannabis Store, where they are taking a lighthearted jab at the illicit market. In a new video ad, the provincial cannabis dealer compares unidentified raw meat to illegally sold cannabis. Sure, the metaphor makes sense for me. It opens with a portly, unkempt, black market meat dealer walking into a nice home, pulling out a Ziploc bag of what appears to be steak. He's greeted by the homeowner, who's initially excited about the contents of the bag. This is some meat heaven right here, says the dealer. The buyer's giddiness over the contents quickly wears off as he starts asking questions about what kind of meat it is. And you can watch the conversation in the video. I have included the link to this story at CannabisPodcast.com, so you can go watch it for yourself. And it ends with the slogan, You wouldn't buy meat like this, followed by the query, Why buy cannabis like this? The YouTube video, currently unlisted and has the comments disabled, was posted on October 6th. The OCS started circulating the video on his Twitter channel, saying, At Ontario's authorized cannabis stores, you'll never be left wondering what you're getting, because every product is rigorously tested certainty. It's the new deal. I just think it's a, a weird metaphor. It doesn't work for me, the old idea of buying raw meat <laughs> and, and comparing that to cannabis, especially the way it's displayed. Like, I don't remember any dealer coming into my house and, and pulling out a baggie right away. And, and, and <laughs> Weird. Weird stuff. You can come to your own conclusion on it. That's the first story from OkanaganZ.com. But the second story is much more important, and that's one that relates to BC and the fact that some cannabis retailers have called for the B.C. Solicitor General's resignation. And again, this is a story written by David Wiley. A group of Okanagan cannabis retailers are calling for the resignation of the B.C.'s Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General, Mike Farnworth. In an open letter to Premier John Horgan, the Okanagan Cannabis Collective says Farnworth has demonstrated he is incapable of handling the file. It is through his failed leadership that the industry has experienced unnecessary hardships, in particular as it relates to the proliferation of illegal brick-and-mortar and illegal online cannabis stores, says the letter sent directly to Horgan on Wednesday. Speaking on behalf of the collective, a former guest of the cannabis podcast way, way back, Spirit Leaf Vernon owner Sarah Ballantyne says that many legal retailers are struggling to survive due to rampant unlicensed pot shops. We were promised change, she says in an interview. And we're not seeing any real change here in the Okanagan. Weed is plentiful here. The black market is thriving. Valentine notes that eliminating the illegal market was the number one mandate of legalization. For years, retailers in the Okanagan have been reporting unlicensed operations throughout the valley, where there are about 20, to the minister and the community safety unit tasked with enforcement. She says neither appear willing to take any action against the stores. To prove their case, the group has put together a Google map of 35 known cannabis stores openly operating in B.C. without a license. She says, why not eliminate some of the restrictions on legal stores to help ease the burden? The collective is asking the province to immediately eliminate the requirement for legal retailers to remit PST, eliminate the 15% wholesale markup on cannabis products from the B.C. LDB. Boy, that would be a good idea. Eliminate the annual cannabis retail licensing fee freeze the issuance of new cannabis licenses, and eliminate the 20% vape tax. That is a ridiculous tax, the way it is being applied in our province. Help us, says Ballantyne. Give us more tools to be successful, or else we're going to start seeing more legal stores closed than open. The market is oversaturated. Many of the unlicensed stores in the Okanagan are operating on indigenous land, where enforcement could clash with reconciliation efforts. Ballantyne says the province needs to do a better job issuing licenses on First Nations land, adding the government has not included Indigenous people properly on legislation. The collective also notes in its letter that in a recent study, 85% of illegal cannabis was found to be unfit for human consumption. Ballantyne says retailers have tried to engage the government without success. It's always a one-way conversation. We always make a lot of noise or make some headlines and they come back and say, No, it's not like that, she says. We've operated longer in a pandemic than not. We're an essential service. The B.C. government says it's trying to balance reconciliation and enforcement. In an email to the OZ, a spokesman with the Ministry of Public Safety and the Solicitor General says, respect for local Indigenous community interests must be taken into consideration. The province is committed to reconciliation, building positive relationships with Indigenous governments, understanding where they have different perspectives and, where possible, collaborating to find resolution says a statement from the ministry. 
The ministry says officers with the Community Safety Unit, which is tasked with enforcing cannabis laws, have been increasing enforcement action and actively following up with unlicensed retailers throughout B.C. The CSU is also educating those who own or operate properties about the potential consequences for allowing their premises to be used for the sale of cannabis, says the ministry. As for enforcement on Indigenous land, the ministry says the CSU is working to make connections with Indigenous communities and considers their views and interests when carrying out compliance and enforcement activities, including reaching out to build relations with chief and council. This has helped develop positive relationships with Indigenous nations and bands and has resulted in obtaining compliance from unlicensed cannabis operations occurring on reserve, says the ministry. The ministry says it has been working with Indigenous communities interested in taking part in the cannabis industry, including the Williams Lake First Nation and the Cowichan tribes. It's been only three years since Canada legalized non-medical cannabis, says the ministry. We remain committed to supporting the growth of a diverse, legal, and strong cannabis sector. We are always reviewing our cannabis regulations and looking to make sure the sector is supported in being as successful as possible. Well, those are pretty words. (laughs) To finish off this story, they, they all sound good, but... They sure don't seem to be actually doing anything to back up any of those statements. So good on the Okanagan Collective for raising the issue once more that there needs to be some change in legislation here in B.C. for cannabis. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And since Sarah Ballantyne referenced the quality of illicit cannabis in the story we did just a little while ago, I'm going back to a story that we did feature an episode or two ago, but only a couple of sections did we really talk about. It was a huge report. This is a pretty good summary of that report, so I thought it was worth kind of reconnecting with that. This is from Mugglehead.com. For those still accessing the illicit cannabis market in Canada, an obvious question remains. Why? While many consumers loyal to the underground will claim that it's still the only place to find real quads, more evidence suggests the regulated market is winning on potency, price, and product safety. On Friday, the New Brunswick Research and Productivity Council, RPC, the province's official research body, released a report analyzing a number of cannabis samples from both the illicit and illicit markets. From both the illicit and illicit markets. The results show that regulation is meeting its intended goals that legal weed closely matches the claims on its packaging in terms of strength and safety. On the flip side, the agency's analysis determined that almost all the illicit products were less potent than advertised, while containing amounts of bacteria and residual pesticides in amounts higher than what's acceptable. For the testing, personnel bought seven flower and six edible samples from illicit storefronts. Four flower and five edible samples were also bought. All the products were analyzed for potency and the same suite of microbial and chemical contaminants. On potency, all of the illicit flour was listed at 30 to 32 percent THC, but testing revealed the actual range was closer to 13 to 22 percent. The legal bud was all listed at 17 percent THC, and the agency said the products tested at 15 to 17 percent THC. Potency claims for illicit were around 30 percent accurate on average, while labels on legal edibles averaged at 90% accurate. For contaminants, four of the six illicit samples contained amounts of mold, bacteria, and yeasts higher than what's acceptable in the regulated market. All the legal samples tested far below posted limits. All of the unregulated products had multiple pesticides, specified in Health Canada's Mandatory Cannabis Testing for Pesticide Active Ingredients list. All of the illicit products were pesticide-free. The report mirrors results of a province-led effort in British Columbia, which found multiple contaminants in a number of samples of illicit bud. Regulatory and quality frameworks not only serve to support health, safety, and security for all stakeholders, but they also work together to manage risk, the RPC notes in the report. It is important to address risk pertaining to products we inhale or ingest. The agency says it's surprising that a significant proportion of cannabis users in Canada have yet to be influenced by safety and quality when purchasing products. The number of Canadians consuming illicit cannabis warranted an investigation into whether these products are equivalent to legal products with respect to consistency, safety, and quality. The RPC has a history of cannabis research dating back to before medical cannabis was legalized in Canada. So there you go. I thought that was an interesting summary of all of those results. We talked about a couple of episodes more to put a finer focus on the fact that the quality of cannabis that you're consuming may be at question if it's not from the legal market. Are you ready for liftoff? Don't miss Canada's number one cannabis conference and trade show, Lift & Co Expo, coming this May 12-15 to to Metro Toronto Convention Centre. 
Level up your industry intel at the Lyft Cannabis Business Conference. Connect with movers and shakers from across the cannabis industry and preview new products and services from 250-plus exhibitors. Plus, everyone loves Lyft & Co. Expo's prizes, live music, and more. Visit liftexpo.ca for tickets. That's liftexpo.ca. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner. Go to the corner. Oh, yeah. Go to the corner. Please explain this stuff to me. And on Cultivar Corner today, we have a local favorite. Well, not actually like really, really local, but but local in the sense that it's some more BC Bud, and local in the sense that it's some more product from a company we've talked about before, and that is Joint Venture Cannabis. JointVentureCraftCannabis.com is the website. You go there, you're going to find a whole bunch of stuff being promoted under a brand name called BC Black, a craft legacy built on tradition. And I'm pleased to say that mm, 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 in my hands right now is a tin, one of those uh, nice little tuna tins, uh, so packed with a little bit of nitro to open it up. I've, I've already popped the tin, though, so you're not going to hear that. <laughs> but this is something that I've been uh, kind of excited for. This is from some people that we talked with a few episodes back. If you remember, we talked with Sherry and Jeff Hoban. They run Smoker Farms, and this is their product. They're really excited about it. They are so stoked to have it out of the market. Jeff has been a grower for a number of years. Uh, he has been working with Master Kush for about 15 years, I think. Master Kush Ultra. It's a cross between G13 and OG Kush, a legacy strain that dates back 15 years. Tightly packed buds, and they are very tightly packed. Dark green in color. The nose is woody and peppery with hints of orange or citrus. Yeah, definitely some woody and... I'm getting a bit of a citrus note on that. This indica strain grown hydroponically with food tables and rockwood cubes, each plant fed by a dosatron nutrient delivery system. Its flowers are meticulously trimmed, hung to dry before being hand-finished and packed in nitrogen for optimal freshness. Expect a one-of-a-kind taste and a smoke that is absolutely loaded with THC. So, as we have been speaking of of late, what's the terpene percentage? <laughs> there we go. I'm going to give the terpene percentage first. This is 3.21% on this brand. You'll be pleased to hear that I took a <laughs> proactive stance, and I've already had my joint rolled. The Crafty Plus is already packed and ready to roll, just waiting for the heat up. So now I can spend a bit of time talking a little bit more about the bud. Smoker Farms, uh, great people, Jeff and Sherry. They were actually in the store the other day, really excited about the fact that Master Kush was going to be available for us. And so let's talk about Master Kush Ultra. The aromas expected to be earthy, sweet, and citrus. Definitely getting some of that. We talked about the chirping percentage already on my uh, batch. It's at 3.21. Website says 3.205. Pretty close. And transcaryophylline, the most prominent, farnesine, and then limonene. In that order, the three most prominent terpenes in Master Kush Ultra. Hmm. Really a delightful aroma. Ha. Ah. If smell is anything, <laughs> Jeff, you've done a good job. Really like the smell. So I also got the viewer's loop out to take a good look at the buds, see what kind of trichrome feels we have. Now, let's talk about the buds. There's been a lot of, well, there are a lot of people out there that always want really big buds. As you've heard before in the Cannabis Podcast, they don't have to be really big buds as long as they're good buds and they get me stoned. And they have an attractive look. And these do have an attractive look. There is not one massive bud. I've got, let's see, one, two, three, four primary buds. And they're what? Probably all of just about a gram. They're about, let me just toss one onto the, onto my <laughs> scale and throw a few things around while I'm doing it <laughs> just to check out one. And yeah, so there you go. That one's actually one gram exactly. So there's all four grams, and obviously they're not all one gram, or or it would be overweight, and it wasn't. It was right on 3.5. But they're they're really nice-looking buds, and you can tell that there has been some care to how they have been trimmed. I'm looking at one, in fact, that, that really shows that there was somebody who really wanted to get this one down to the ultimate part of the bud and has scraped off all of the sugar leaves, virtually none, even when I look at it through the Judas loop. 
I'm not seeing a bunch of sugar leaves. Now, I did want to comment on the trichome fields. They seem to be pretty vast in most of the buds that I have taken a peek at, and I always like to do that with some fresh cannabis. Surprised a little bit that there aren't quite as many amber trichomes as I might have expected in a, a Master Kush Ultra, something certainly on the heavy on the indica side. But we'll find out when we smoke it, but there are a lot of trichomes, and they oh no, there's, okay, this piece has a bit more amber on it. I guess it depends on the bud you're looking at and the particular part of the bud you're looking at. Yeah, there's definitely more amber in, in that mode. They're nice looking buds. So as they say, they are definitely a dark green. Lots of red hairs in there, which is again pretty typical for cannabis. And lovely aroma. And when I did grind them up, there was much more aroma. More of that earthiness uh, that really came out. A little bit of the sweetness, but certainly more of the earthiness when I was in the middle of the grind. So I have my joint prepared. I actually almost lit it while I wasn't recording just because I out of habit. As soon as I finished rolling a joint, I light it, but I didn't. I held on just for you. So this is something we've been looking forward to. BC Black's Master Kush Ultra crafted by Smoker Farms. And in fact, I'm going to take my first hit out of the vaporizer because I want this to be the full flavor profile. Oh, now there's definitely some earthiness there. Some of the sweetness is rolling it. A bit of that hint of citrus coming through through the vaporizer. Oh, very pleasant. Very smooth. Very, very, very smooth. I like that. THC, have we talked about that yet? I don't think we have. I told you what the terpene percentage of 3.21 was, but the THC on this guy is sitting at 26.2%. <laughs> on the website, they give the range of 23 to 27%, and, and I guess at 26.2, we came out on the high side of that range. Very nice. And the terpenes, clearly there's enough terpenes to give you lots of flavor. Very flavorful in the vaporizer. <sighs> And I can feel a bit of that high creeping up on me now. Mmm, yes. <laughs> There's the happy eyes that I absolutely love. And, and wow, there they are. <laughs> and that's after, what, three hits off the vaporizer, I guess. But is that going to stop me? <laughs> no. It's time we see what the joint does. Let's take a look at the at the final cure of Smoker Farms Master Kush Ultra. Still smooth. Not a harsh smoke through the joint. As I look at that ash build up. Oh, very nice. Just immediately to a nice white ash as soon as that burns. Nice even burn down my joint, which of course I guess is more indicative of whether my roll was good. <laughs> so yeah, my roll was good. Mm. Yeah, I like the taste through the joint. Let's go back and have another hit on the vaporizer. Oh, oh, the flavor profile. <laughs> through the Crafty Plus is just absolutely divine. Just enough earthiness to make it <laughs> unique. A sweetness to kind of make you want some more. And just a hint of citrus to let you know that there's a bit of limonene that's hanging around in there. Mmm. And as I said, I don't know, back a couple minutes ago... <laughs> I've lost track of time. The, the happy eyes definitely came on, uh, and they are still there. And moving a little bit into a bit of a body stone for me, which, again, I'm hoping for. I am looking forward to the indica aspects of a Master Kush Ultra. Oh, yes. Just got a bit of a buzz. <laughs> no, I didn't mean a buzz. I, yes, I do have a buzz, but <laughs> I made a rush. <laughs> okay. I may have reached that stone state. 
and I got here in fairly short order. At 26.3%. Oh, yeah, definitely the happy eyes are there. <laughs> and and I love that in a good cannabis. BC Black Master Kush Ultra, crafted by Smoker Farms. Mm. Jeff, master grower, been at it for a lot of years, finally made the transition over into the legal market, has now found a way to get his fabulous cannabis into the hands of consumers like you and I. Jeff, Good on you, bud. You did a great job. And Sherry, the support you're giving Jeff to keep Smoker Farms going and build the company. Fabulous job, you two. Happy to be friends and happy to be smoking your cannabis. Well done. And with the reference again in an earlier story about the proliferation of cannabis stores and how we might have exceeded our capacity, uh, this story actually has a bit of concern. This is another one from Mugglehead.com. High Tide's Canna Cabana stores get approval to operate in B.C., Leading Canadian cannabis retailer High Tide Incorporates, popular Canna Cabana chain, is setting its sights on expanding to the country's westernmost market. High Tide said Tuesday that the British Columbia Liquor Distribution Branch granted due diligence approval to Canna Cabana, effectively licensing the stores to operate the province. With that approval in hand, the firm says it can now proceed with site-specific license applications. High Tide notes that B.C. is a global tourist destination with over 6 million overnight international visitor arrivals in 2019, according to the Tourism Industry Association of B.C. With an estimated population of 5.2 million, it's Canada's third most populous province. With around 374 open stores, there's more room to grow before hitting saturation, especially compared to neighboring Alberta, with 691 stores servicing its population of around 4.4 million. And if I can take a bit of a sidebar here, I'm not sure Alberta should be the standard you're looking at for saturation, because there's already been a lot to talk about Alberta being oversaturated, Ontario being oversaturated. We don't want to bring the same oversaturation to BC, which we've already achieved in some circumstance. Okay, that's enough of the sidebar. According to a recent study for a Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research, legal cannabis sales in BC doubled between 2019 and 2020. In a statement, CEO Raj Grover noted the province is famous for its BC bud and has a long history of accepting cannabis culture and was ground zero for legalization in Canada. I am thrilled that, very soon, BC residents and tourists will be able to enjoy an unparalleled selection of cannabis and consumption accessories at unbeatable prices through our signature one-stop shop experiences. Now, again, I'm going to do a bit of a sidebar. That's pretty well the end of that story. And my sidebar is because all cannabis stores have to buy through the BC LDB, the selection of cannabis is not going to be much different than everybody else. <laughs> but here we go. Do you think we've reached saturation in BC in terms of cannabis retainers? I guess we'll find out. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And again, in celebration of the fact that we have reached three years of legalization in our country, I thought this would be an interesting opportunity to look back at how it used to be before legalization. Why Why what we have achieved is so valuable for us. This all resulted from, I was sitting in the studio the other day, and I guess I've been on a recent buying splurge where I was purchasing a number of different cultivars, either getting ready for a cultivar corner or just because I wanted to try something different. And I, I looked around at what I had in the studio and I realized I had a stinking lot of weed here. <laughs> and, and there were times prior to legalization where that was far from the truth. In fact, there were probably more times prior to legalization when there was a scarcity of weed in, in either my room or anybody else's room simply because of the way the world worked back then. I mean, you had to have your dealer. I had a few dealers over the years. And, you know, here in the Okanagan, I ended up with a couple that were probably the last dealers I dealt with. There was one distinct advantage of a dealer in terms of purchasing your cannabis, and that was if you had a good relationship with that dealer, they allowed you to buy on credit, which I did a number of times. <laughs> Drop by and say, man, can I get an eighth? Can I get a quarter? On, and I'll pay you next week for it. And, of course, if you were a good customer, inevitably they found the way to, to let you take that away and come back and pay for it later. That meant that the next time you came by for a quarter, it was like it was double the price because you're paying for the last one you had, too. But that was one of the advantages of, of having a dealer. But the other disadvantage, again, was the scarcity of supply. If that dealer didn't have anything, well, that was it. You were out. You went back home. 
probably started digging up roaches and, and seeing if you could <laughs> how many joints you could make out of those roaches. And when I looked around and I saw all this cannabis that I had available in front of me at that particular moment, that's when I really realized that was one of the biggest changes that we have achieved since reaching legalization. And that is that you can go in, in pretty well any town you live, maybe some of them are oversaturated from a retail perspective, but you don't have to wait until your dealer's home. You don't have to go hang out his, at his house and spend 30, 45 minutes in there so it doesn't look like there's frequent traffic in and out of the house. I mean, most of them are nice people, but I didn't necessarily want to spend a ton of time there. So you don't have to do that anymore. You can go between what are typical retail hours. Most stores are open 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. or some variation of that theme. And and you don't have to do it in a dark alley. You, you don't have to meet up and, and hand somebody some money and he hands you a pack of you don't know what you're getting and then off you go in your different directions. There are so many positives to the fact that we have reached legalization here in BC. And I think it's important that we take a step back and, and realize what we have accomplished. We waited so long. We waited so long for legalization to happen. Yes, there's issues that can be fixed. Yes, there's a lot of things that need to change. We still need to address the edible dosage limit. That is totally absurd. And that's what makes the cannabis legalization appear more Mickey Mouse than anything else. That 10 milligram limit on edible dosages, which anybody who has any kind of tolerance for THC, as we have spoken about many times, that that 10 milligrams doesn't do much. So that's a change that needs to happen. We need to change the fact that we still can't do real advertising. I mean, look at all the ads you see for booze these days, both print and and in television and other media, plastered across our screens. And yet we can't even say the word cannabis or or advertise anything of our products other than saying, here is the product. It's as simple as that. That's got to change. We've got to be able to take more of the stigma away from this. There's still so much stigma associated to that. It still kills me when I see all these organizations doing their their wine clubs and their wine draws and and, and all of those things. And, and, and if you were to suggest a cannabis draw, <gasps> oh, people were aghast with that. I, I did actually suggest it at a couple of the organizations I was with, and it didn't go over well. So there's things that still have to change, but I mean, really. We have accomplished a lot in this last three years. We're getting better. The, the quality of the weed improved vastly. Go back to the first few episodes when we were doing, I think we called them strain reviews back then. And a lot of the pot we were talking about was pretty dry. You could take it in your fingers and you could squeeze it and turn it into dust. That's not happening anymore. We've now had the introduction of a whole bunch of craft growers. They've come into the market. The people who were legacy growers for years and years talked about Smoker Farms. We talked about Ocanacraft. And and there are many more that are based on a legacy in cannabis, a legacy of growing fantastic cannabis. Now they're in the legal market. This industry is growing so much. It's going to change so much more. As we head into 2022 here in BC, the whole idea of being able to go to those craft growers and purchase from those farms is, is going to be available. That's going to change the industry incredibly. Local is where we're going. Local is where the future of cannabis is. And you have those big organizations like Hexo made some remark in some social media this last week, calling all of these craft growers ankle biters, <laughs> implying that they, they weren't as big and, and bold as they are. Well, I think they got it wrong because I think the the power in the future is going to be those craft growers. And those ankle biters have taken that to heart. There's lots of references to being an ankle biter. <laughs> but they grow some pretty darn good pot. So things have improved. These last three years, we have used it to grow and to get better. Let's use the next couple of years to grow and get better. And when we get back together after five years of legalization, let's hope the legal edible limit has been raised. We've been able to advertise more and we were able to access more craft cannabis directly from the growers. That's what I hope to see. What are your thoughts? Send them in. If you have thoughts about legalization, where we are, or any other comments that you have about anything you heard on the Cannabis Podcast, you can do so to info at CannabisPodcast.com. And CannabisPodcast.com is where you will always find all of the links to everything that gets talked about in each episode, and the same with this one. That wraps it up for Episode 82. Happy Cannabis Day from the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley... This was the Cannabis Podcast.